right. <coughs> Next, we <coughs> are going to start our roundtable discussions. Uh, beginning uh, is Jeff Crocker with uh, a presentation of uh, the need for a feasibility of a basic income, based on his book, Basic Income and Sovereign Money. And uh, Jeff reminded me that when Zoom participants are talking, I'm giving them the wall, but <laughs> now I'm giving you the floor. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation to address your conference. I haven't been to Helsinki for about 30 years, so it's very nice to come back and see your very beautiful city again. Um, so I'm going to give this presentation, which is based around the theme of my book, and the book is called Basic Income and Sovereign Money. So the, the proposal is a twin proposal. It's for basic income funded by what I will call sovereign money, and I'll try to explain that in the presentation. So quickly, the case of basic income, which many of us will be familiar with because you're basic income activists, and I've tried to set this out on the website, the case of basic income at ubi.org, which I would um, invite you, A, to have a look at, and B, to use as an advocacy resource, if you wish. Um, here's the case of basic income based around these um, five headings. One is social justice, which we're familiar with. We're all interested in seeing social justice, in addressing the huge inequality that we face, in addressing the precarity that the employment um, market has, has produced, and the, the insecurity of income and life that that has uh, led to, and in, um, in implementing a shared inherited um, infrastructure and technology. So this is a question of human ontology, a philosophical question really, that we're all born uh, with certain rights to sunshine, to rain, to grass and all the rest of it, and we also have a right to the infrastructure and the technology that we inherit, and that should be a universal right of inheritance, not an elite right of inheritance. Uh, basic income is also the best welfare system, i.e. it's less intrusive, it's lower cost, it has higher uptake than means-tested benefits. And, of course, it therefore avoids the humiliation and the intrusion um, of means-tested benefits. And when we advocate <coughs> basic income as a tool for social justice, we also do need to recognise that targeted welfare benefits are um, an alternative proposal um, for the same objective. And we need to show why basic income, in our view, is a superior strategy. And basic income, therefore, also avoids unemployment and poverty traps that are inherent in most current targeted welfare benefit systems. Because rather than basic income providing a disincentive to work, it's actually current welfare systems that uh, have a disincentive to work because, as you know, if you get a job, you get some wage, you lose your benefit, um, excuse me for the English, but pound for pound or euro for euro, whereas with the UBI, you won't, and therefore it's not a work disincentive. Then we come to the question of macroeconomic demand, and, and I will present um, an analysis which suggests that technology and automation um, has been sucking income, sucking labour income out of the economy, uh, making some people income deficient and increasingly reliant on more benefits and upon indeed household debt. Um, and therefore, a basic income would address this sucking of income out of the economy by technology and help us to avoid the debt, the crisis and the austerity that the present model produces. It has, as our colleagues were saying earlier, a huge ecological benefit in that it breaks the link between income and employment, you know, and yet more output and yet more resource depletion and yet more emissions and yet more pollution. So basic income is an ecologically positive proposal. And finally, but not to least, it encourages human flourishing, i.e. the choice of lifestyle, what people want to do with their lives, um, becomes less dictated by the straitjacket of the 8 to 4 factory life or the 9 to 5 office life. Um, and if the technology allows us that choice to flourish, why do we not want to take it? So then we come to this thorny, prickly issue of how do we fund the basic income such that we avoid the, the challenge that UBI is either too small to be meaningful or too large to be affordable. So I've tried on this table to set out what the various funding options that are usually pr proposed are. One proposed by several of my colleagues in the UK is a revenue neutral approach to basic income that it's funded by higher taxation 
and by the replacement of other benefits. My comment would be, sure, that does achieve unconditionality, which is a major gain. It, in, it, in, it reduces intrusion and hopefully, though not in all cases, but hopefully uh, produces less poverty. Um, then there's the proposal of a wealth tax. My comment there is that however socially just that might be, it's pretty difficult to organize a wealth tax because of the range of assets that people hold. You know, so if you look in the UK situation, and, and I do apologize that all my numeric examples are UK for obvious reasons. Um, if you look at the UK example, there's something like 12 trillion pounds um, of wealth held in the UK. So one of my colleagues says, okay, take half a percent of that, we pay for basic income. But when you look at the composition of that wealth, it's people's houses. Um, and some people it's uh, shares in a PLC or it might be shares in their private company and so on. Or it might be a, a luxury yacht, but not in many cases. Or it might be money in the bank. So there are all sorts of assets that people might hold. Um, and how you tax those assets in a fair way, I think is pretty difficult. You know, if, can you pay a wealth tax with wealth? Because the definition of a wealth tax in my mind would be that you can pay it with wealth. Is the state going to then accept wealth? Is it going to accept your PLC shares or your yacht or whatever it may be? Um, or actually, is it going to be paid out of income? If it's going to be paid out of income, which is normally the case with a wealth tax, um, then actually it's a form of income tax with wealth as a parameter. Uh, land tax, my argument there would be that the most profitable companies in the present um, age, the present economic age, the FANG companies, the, um, the uh, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix and Google, uh, these companies earn huge profits with very little land actually, because you know we're no longer in, in an agriculturally dominated economy or industrial, we're in a virtual in, um, in intelligence uh, economy. And these companies, the most profitable, use little land and therefore would pay very little tax under a land tax. The eco tax, my critique would be that we should not be using um, eco taxes to raise revenue. We should be using eco taxes to stop emissions. Um, and therefore I think there's a, um, there's a, a, a dual argument here which is, which is leading us in the wrong direction. Um, and eco tax should self cancel. And sovereign fund investment requires one of those above. So I'm going to be arguing for sovereign money creation, a different approach to the creation of money into the economy, which is indeed a heterodox um, economic paradigm, but one which I hope I'm going to be able to show has some credibility and isn't just wacky, if you know the English word wacky. Um, so reasons why, in my view, basic income needs to be associated with a proposal for debt-free sovereign money. First, as I've said, it's the only way to deliver adequate basic income at an affordable cost and therefore breaks this challenge that UBI is either too small to be meaningful or too large to be affordable. Secondly, that it is a consistent argument for both debt-free sovereign money as for basic income. Now, I will expand this argument, but a thought experiment of a totally automated economy where there was no wage and no labor, in such an economy, goods and services would have to be distributed by vouchers created and destroyed each year. The vouchers represent a basic income, 100% of GDP, and they represent debt-free sovereign money. So it's a consistent argument. And thirdly, that the pilot of basic income plus debt-free sovereign money has uh, been delivered in the COVID economy. Um, again, these are UK figures, excuse me, but UK furlough scheme paid £24,000 a year to 3 million people. Now, that's not a UBI because it's not universal, but it is um, structurally close to a UBI proposal, and the cost was £72 billion. All of that was funded within the Bank of England, our central bank, buying 875 billion of government debt, equal to 40% of government debt. And my argument is that since the Bank of England is owned by the government, actually, in net terms, that's not debt at all. So I'm arguing that that actually is a demonstration that debt-free sovereign money um, can be held in the economy to fund something like um, a UBI scheme without causing the collapse of either hyperinflation or devaluation of the currency that all the critics had previously predicted. And I personally think this is the most important pilot of UBI that we have seen because it is a pilot of a macroeconomic UBI. Um, and the proposal is therefore 
linked to these twin needs that I think we face. One is to get income to people, and the other is to get debt out of the economy. So it shows the FBI proposal to be fundamental to a reconsideration of the um, economic system. Now, we're all aware that the present economic paradigm, whilst it does actually work to some degree, I mean, we're all here, we've all ate lunch, and we all uh, are clothed. So it's not like it's broken down completely, but it does have significant dysfunctionalities. One is the, the crisis, which was actual 13 years ago and could well repeat. Secondly is the pervasive debt in the system, both at household and government level. Third is the continuation of austerity policy with its huge social um, costs. Um, then extensive poverty, including in-work poverty. And the fact that we see in-work poverty demonstrates surely that work is no longer the guaranteed provider of adequacy of income that it used to be and that we hope it will be. It's currently not. We see low-paid jobs. We see increased inequality both between those who are working, those who are not working, and uh, within the groups that, that work. You know, we're seeing on the one hand stratospheric salaries going to an elite and low pay going to others. And we're seeing huge ecological damage. So that level of dysfunctionality suggests that we need a radical rethink and we need to see a re-engineering of the economic system. Very quickly, the explanation that people usually forwarded of the crisis in 2007, 2008, was that it was bad behavior. Um, it was bad banks who created excess debt through derivatives, and it was bad governments who failed to regulate. And the corrections that were put in place were tighter bank regulations through conditionality increase on bank loans, quantitative easing, which was very big in quantitative numbers, and austerity. My argument would be that since that hasn't addressed these fundamental dysfunctionalities, we need to think again. Is simultaneous universal malpractice by every bank in every country and every government in every country, is that a credible hypothesis? I actually don't think it is. Um, what actually caused the debt explosion? Was the US prime debt for housing or consumption? And is the crisis structural rather than behavioral? And, and undoubtedly there will be bad behavior somewhere within the economy, but my argument would be that the crisis was structural in the following way. And please, this is all hypothesis, so please feel free to come back at me at any point because what I really welcome, it would be your critique because I want to refine this, uh, this line of thought. So the structure of this dysfunctionality is that automation increases productivity in the sense that it increases output per hour worked, um, I think that's undeniable. Reduced wages per out per unit of output, and I'll show some graphs to show that's the case. And real wages falling behind productivity. Do we find that, that robots are destroying jobs? Not yet that pervasively, but could be the next phase. But what is happening um, in box three, and I should remember these, but in box three, we are seeing income sucked out of the economy. We are seeing in box two, the bifurcation of employment into very high paid specialty jobs and very low pay bullshit jobs and inequality um, rising inexorably. And we are seeing box one, uh, reduced labor bargaining, bargaining power. So the test of my hypothesis as to whether technology is sucking income out of the economy is what's happening in the relationship between aggregate labor income and GDP, and I accept all the critique earlier of GDP, by the way, so I'm just using that as a rough rule of thumb at the moment. Um, what's happening is that the, this difference is forcing households to increase their debt, increasing government welfare spend. Those both hit some kind of limit as they increase, and the limit leads to constraint, and we hit crisis, we hit austerity, poverty and equality on the increase in ecology and humanity uh, suffering. Um, so this is the thought experiment that I referred to earlier. If we were to plug a machine into the earth for the total economic output so that there were no wages in the economy, um, we would have to distribute that output through an annual voucher, which in my thought experiment is actually destroyed each year, reissued the next year. That corresponds to 100% of the economy being basic income. And it corresponds to 100% of the economy also being sovereign money i.e. debt-free, like coinage. 
So the, the nuanced argument from that is that if in a totally automated economy we've got 100% basic income and 100% debt-free uh, sovereign money, then in a partially automated economy we have a partial need for basic income and a partial need for debt-free money. So we see that unearned or basic income becomes an essential component of the expression of demand in the economy and sovereign money becomes essential to fund basic income and government expenditure. The empirical evidence for that um, is that earned income has declined against consumer expenditure in the UK, this is, from 1948 to 2016, which I will show on a graph in a moment, that huge household debt is acting as a surrogate for the missing basic income, which should be there, and huge government debt um, is acting as a surrogate for the missing sovereign money that we need in the economy. And as I said a moment ago, the Bank of England purchased 875 billion of government debt, which I claim is equivalent to debt-free sovereign money. And the project that we've been running at the Institute for Policy Research at the University of Bath in the UK has tested the hypothesis that technology is sucking income out of the economy in a three-year a multi-country study taking 23 country economies data and demonstrating through regression that technology is indeed reducing the labor share. So this is the empirical evidence UK and I'd be very happy to include further country economies evidence if it becomes available that labor income has declined consistently versus consumer expenditure all the way from 1948 to 2016. And you'll see the top line there is labor income. It includes uh, self-employed income. And I have had the direct help of our Office of National Statistics in ensuring this data is valid and correct and properly interpreted. And we do see this delinking of productivity and real wages. Um, and I would point out that this argument relies on automation, not growth. Uh, so we could have a degrowth proposal. And in the degrowth proposal, if the output was still produced by automation, it would still not be delivering the income needed for aggregate demand. And uh, you can see that in about 1995, there's a crossover between these two lines. Up till that point, labor income is adequate for cons consumer expenditure. After that point, it's not. And so consumer expenditure becomes funded increasingly by unearned income of welfare benefits, of dividends, of pensions, and worryingly, of household debt. <clears throat> and this is the same picture for the German economy seeing the same, same divergence. Um, empirical evidence in the UK again, household debt is 1.28 trillion, it's 61% of GDP, and uh, government debt everywhere is increasing in the world. I must update these graphs because now certainly the UK debt is equal to 100% of GDP, and as you know, Japanese debt is equal to 250% of GDP. And my argument would be this is just mythical, this is just delusional. You know, no economy can pay back 250% of its annual output. I mean, however you redefine GDP to properly reflect human well-being, which I accept it should be, but for the moment, um, that output of goods and services, there's no way you can repay a 250% uh, uh, debt of GDP. And I think we've got to, an economist, uh, academics and politicians and us all have got to face up to the mythology of this uh, situation. So um, household debt and government debt are constraining expenditure. Um, it is pushing um, an, a continuous program of austerity, which is why conceptually, and this at the moment is conceptually, um, I would want to see that household debt replaced by basic income and that government debt replaced by sovereign money so that we can restore austerity cuts. It does mean redefining our money, how we think of money. We need to rethink the definition of money in the economy, redefine what we mean by affordability. At the moment, affordability is defined by how much money we've got in our bank accounts, and, and we even apply that at government level. You know, so social affordability in the, in the total economy is thought to be dependent on how much money the exchequer has got. And actually, it's not. As Keynes, uh, our great British economist, said, anything we can actually do, we can afford. So you know, affordability is defined by whether we can actually build that bridge, rather than whether we've got the right amount of money in the government exchequer. And therefore we take debt out of the system. So we move from financial orthodoxy, where money determines outcomes, and in orthodoxy, 
where accountancy is prime over economics, money is thought to have an inherent value, either because it used to link to gold reserves, or now because it links to the sale of government bonds which create debt. And in this view, money is real, can't be created or destroyed unless it's matched by debt or gold. Government budgets must balance, and household and government expenditure become debt financed and therefore limited by debt. So affordability is defined in the current paradigm by government financial reserves. Compare that to a more heterodox theory of money, i.e. sovereign money, where money enables outcomes rather than money determining there is constraint to outcomes. In this paradigm, money has no inherent value. There actually is a magic money tree. It's pretty obvious with digital money, you know, a keystroke money. At a keystroke tomorrow, the central bank could put a thousand euros in all your bank account. That's technically possible if they actually. Money is thought to have an inherent value, either because it used to link to gold reserves, or now because it links to the sale of government bonds which create debt. And in this view, money is real, can't be created or destroyed unless it's matched by debt or gold. Government budgets must balance, and household and government expenditure become debt financed and therefore limited by debt. So affordability is defined in the current paradigm by government financial reserves. Compare that to a more heterodox theory of money, i.e. sovereign money, where money enables outcomes rather than money determining there is constraint to outcomes. In this paradigm, money has no inherent value. There actually is a magic money tree. It's pretty obvious with digital money, you know, a keystroke money. At a keystroke tomorrow, the central bank could put a thousand euros in all your bank account. That's technically possible if they actually had your bank account details. So there is a magic money tree. Um, but money derives its value from output GDP. Again, apologies for the GDP use, but from the, the output of the real economy. So a sovereign state can issue money versus its national output without necessarily creating debt. Sovereign money is needed in high technology economies for the reasons I gave earlier, and household and government expenditure are then funded by sovereign money. Not unbounded sovereign money, but sovereign money bounded by the uh, out affordability now becomes defined by real resources of labor, of land, of raw materials, um, of time, and of technology, and productive potential. And Keynes again, anything we can actually do, we can afford, which you would think was obvious, but it doesn't seem very obvious in the financial orthodoxy of today. I mean, everybody understands that last line except accountants, with apologies to any accountants here. So looking at the definition of sovereign money, a brief, a brief diversion into modern monetary theory, MMT definition. So the MMT definition of, uh, of sovereign money by Stephanie Kelton and Randall Ray um, is that sovereign money is there to fund a job guarantee because the MMT school still believes that we can continue to generate high-wage employment, which is, a, which is a presumption I question given the role of automation. That money creation must be matched by debt creation, so they still see that money is debt, um, which I disagree with, um, and that that debt is created is balanced by surpluses in, in other sectors of the economy, uh, identified by the British economist Wynne Godley. Um, and then they would apply a zero interest rate to that debt. The definition of bank money by Joseph Huber, uh, my friend in Berlin, is that sovereign money has to be a state monopoly, i.e. you can't have, in his view, commercial banks creating money. Um, I don't agree with that, actually, because I don't think the state banks have the capability to create personal and business loans. Or the basic income definition, which I'm advancing, i.e. that sovereign money funds aggregate demand to full potential output GDP. Money creation is debt-free, not matched by debt creation. It avoids excessive consumer and public sector debt, which leads to crisis and austerity. It eliminates intermediate arbitrage, uh, reducing the financialization of the economy. Because uh, in most systems, when the central bank buys government debt currently, it's not allowed to buy it in the primary market. Um, the only people allowed to buy in the primary market are pension funds, insurance companies, stockbrokers, rich individuals, and foreign central banks. That means that the um, central bank of that country can only buy in the secondary market. When it moves in to buy huge amounts, as has happened through COVID expenditure, um, it's basically generating a risk-free margin to those intermediaries. Personally, I think that's a scandal. So that arbitrage and financialization we need to reduce. 
and it returns seigniorage um, to the state. So there's an attempt in a little table there to summarize those three views of sovereign money. So money is not equal to debt. Um, the academic perspective is growing that money is not quintessentially debt. And I refer you there to a couple of articles, one by Michael Kumhoff, who is actually head of research at the Bank of England, um, and, and his other colleagues on central bank money. Is it a liability, an asset, or equity of the nation? And of uh, Biagio Bossoni and Costa, um, money for the issuer. So there's an increasing uh, academic view that money is not essentially debt. So here, I won't go into this diagram in any detail, you'll be glad to hear, but that's an attempt to look at um, the money creation and flow in the present economy and the way in which, with the dotted lines, we, I would be proposing to put sovereign money into government expenditure and quantitative easing, but for the people, i.e. Um, to fund a basic income. Life of bonds, as I said, the government at the moment spend, funds its expenditure by tax and by borrowing. Um, there has been huge COVID spend borrowing, whereby our UK debt management office sells gilts to insurance companies and pension funds. Um, I, I've been through most of this process a moment ago, and this is generating risk-free margin to intermediaries, but it is equivalent to debt-free sovereign money. And that's a graph of the increase in holdings of government debt by the central bank, rendering it not debt. Um, and in this uh, paradigm of um, debt-free sovereign money, which I've called cheekily at the top the ultimate liberation theology, A, it's demonstrably feasible because cash, in notes and coins, which are only 3% of the money base, but they're currently issued without the government assuming any debt for them. Um, and this example of central banks taking a significant um, share of the national debt it's demonstrably feasible and it's convincingly preferable. Why? Because it eliminates this myth of national debts greater than GDP, which are never repayable. They are not a burden for our grandchildren. Nobody is going to repay them. Um, it eliminates the debt servicing cost of that debt, which in the UK currently is 41 billion a year, rising actually to, towards 70 billion. It enables, which is of interest to us, necessary basic income to households and government welfare spend, eliminates crisis, eliminates austerity, reduces financialization of the economy, and returns seigniorage, that's the pr profit you get by cr creation of money, to the, to the state. Everybody's concerned about inflation. Is UBI funded by sovereign money inflationary? Um, you know, will it produce Weimar and will it produce a Zimbabwe situation? But hyperinflation, of course, requires a breakdown in the real supply sector of the economy. We're not facing that condition. You know, the real supply side of the economy is perfectly okay at the moment, apart from the COVID restrictions. Okay, there's some supply chain difficulties currently. Um, but essentially, the factories, the railways, the telecom systems are all working okay. All the economies, of course, print and create money. I have some in my pocket. The question is not whether you should create money. The question is how much. And the answer is that the rule of economic management is that you only create money up to the level of funding output production. Um, so um, I've covered most of these points before. But the rule is that the sum of all demand in the economy, including UBI, must not exceed output of the economy. And that's, you know, fundamental. Since Keynes, that has been implemented in virtually every economy in the world. So we've seen a paradigm shift from two crises, the 2007 crisis and the 2020 pandemic. The furlough scheme has shown that UBI, it's not U, but it is a BI, does work, funded by so debt-free sovereign money, which also has worked without collapse. We've got a research program going at the moment, and uh, in the following projects, first is with Cambridge Econometrics, and they have a multi-sectoral model of the UK economy, and they're running that to test the macroeconomic stability of a solution with UBI and debt-free sovereign money, that it doesn't produce hyperinflation or devaluation. They're then going to simulate the effect of increased productivity in the macroeconomic model on an increased need for further basic income and sovereign money. And secondly, through the Freiburg Center for Business uh, for Basic Income Studies, together with another Cambridge University project, 
um, we're using a stop flow consistent model um, derived from Wynne Godley's view of stop flow consistency to do the same thing, to test for um, stable equilibrium in the macro economy with UBI and debt free sovereign money and simulation of increased productivity. And at the Institute for Policy Research at the University of Bath, a further three year postdoc project producing policy papers from those um, modeling exercises. So, and I'm about to end. Um, basic income and debt free sovereign money is a corrective for economic crisis and austerity policy. The system's generated by what we can produce. Um, we issue debt free sovereign money to fund government expenditure and basic income, and it leads to a new paradigm. Uh, where we don't need austerity, uh, poverty and inequality reduce, ecology and humanity benefits increase, we've got no crisis and a reduced financialization of the economy through government bonds and seigniorage. And uh, finally, a reference to my book, not because I want to sell it because I get no, no royalties from it, um, but it's there if you are interested. It's available through the usual market sources and recommended by uh, Ben Neumaker, Thomas Pally and and Nick Pierce, which takes which obviously a, a more thorough explanation of what I've just presented. So I'm about five minutes late. <laughs>